tremendous love of God. I know we hadn't covered that passage yet in James, but we maybe maybe we will today. But the whole second chapter of the book starts off by being totally offended by the fact that some people are treated differently than others, that the church has partiality in it. And the reason why it offends James so much is because it's totally contrary to the gospel. The gospel is whosoever will, let him come. Rich, poor, whosoever, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever, purple, uh, in, out, up, down, smart, not so smart, whosoever will, let him come. And partiality says, uh, we judge you by your face. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just a little pre-word <laughs> pre about the word. Oh my, I'm telling you guys, God's word is so full and rich, seriously. It, it is, and I, uh, it, it, I don't know why I feel seemingly more responsible all the time, but I do about it and about you knowing it and about you realizing what God's saying to you because it is such a critical, critical time that we're in. And I know I've said that, and I sound like a broken record saying stuff like that to you, but I, I, just, I just know that God wants his people prepared, and I want you to be prepared for whatever it is. I mean, you know, I, uh, do I think we're going to be attacked and killed tomorrow? No. Do I think the world, America's blowing up? No. I, I don't know what what might happen, but I do know that live, our lives are being affected by some real deep spiritual battles that are going yeah, on. Yeah. And if you could see into the spirit realm, I'll tell you what you would be seeing. You would be seeing warfare going on right now. Yes, if you could see around you into the spirit realm, <laughs> the book of Ephesians says, for you wrestle not against flesh and blood, yeah. but you wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God that you might stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Mm -hmm. Have your loins girt about with the truth. Have on the helmet of salvation, yeah. the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with, with the preparation to preach the gospel of peace. And take the shield of faith with which you can quench all the fiery darts of the yeah, wicked one. Yeah. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Bible tells us that the Word of God is our weapon. You know, it's great to play defense. Everybody needs a good defense. I could make some jokes about the saints' defense and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But uh, they're doing pretty good now. And you know why? Because of their defense. They finally learn how to play it. But anyway, uh, they're doing good. And it's defense. And defense is a wonderful thing. And they tell you, you have to have defenses to win championships. And we've watched basketball teams and baseball teams and football teams and hockey teams and everything else with good defenses win games. But I'm telling you that as a child of God in this spiritual battle that we're fighting, you have to have a good defense. That's why you have the the the... the Spirit, that's why you have the armament of God. Yeah. But you got to play offense sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the only offensive weapon that a child of God has in this spiritual battle of life is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And with that sword of the Spirit, you play offense. And I want to make sure you know what weapon you have. I want you to have the goods. Yeah. I want you to be able to know where you stand, what you stand in, who stands with you, what kind of power you stand in, what the enemy can do, what he can't do, what his strategies are, what he tries to do. He does the same thing all the time, by the way, folks. The devil is not original. He's not original at all. He just he uses the same tricks over and over and over and over. You know why? Because they work. The reason they work is because we don't know what they are. Because nobody tells us what they are. Well, James is, just, James is just loading you down with information about what it is the enemy is up to in the life of a child of God and how to live out the faith that you say that you have. Yeah. James says, look, don't, show, don't, don't talk to me about stuff. 
Show it to me. I mean, don't, don't tell me you have faith. Show me your faith. And you might be saying, what would faith look like? Well, that's what the book of James is about. It's about how to recognize when you have the real stuff. Look at the neighbor and say, you want the real thing. Yeah, you want the real thing, right? <laughs> Not, yeah, the real thing. I mean, let's just get down to it. You want it to be real. And so James says, all right, well, let's make it real. And so he begins in chapter 1. We've been through it for about a, a month now or more. And I'm not going to drag you back through that. But we didn't finish last week with an outline that I had created for you. And by the way, all these outlines, there's nothing magical about the outlines. It's just my way of trying to group stuff together so that you, it'll make sense to you, really. That's what it, because James, the book of James is like a sermon outline. I mean, it's just... He, he starts off talking about this, and then all of a sudden something pops up, and he says, oh, yeah, and he chases that a second, and then some other rabbit pops, and oh, yeah. And, and so just like most preachers, everybody say amen. amen. Like most preachers, he chases rabbits a lot. But the difference between James and other preachers is James catches all his rabbits, and he runs them right back, and they all make sense, and they're just tremendous but you do kind of have to have a scorecard somewhat with the book of James to kind of get the flow of, of what he's actually really dealing with because he's a very passionate person and the Holy Spirit is just inspiring some deep, deep things. I'm talking about deep, deep things. Wesley up here on the front row smiling. He's smiling. You know why? Because he's been studying some of those deep, deep things. Now, you might not appreciate them. I don't even know whether you would or not. But, but uh, those of us that like studying the Word, we love them, don't we, bro? Yeah. <laughs> They're fun for us. Yeah. But uh, I, wanted to, I, want, I want to finish up what I was saying last week because it really is important, and it just naturally leads right into what James continues to say this week. Uh, James was saying last week, and put, put the verses up on the screen, not all of them. I'm not starting with verse 1. I'm starting where we stopped, verse 16, 17, 18, and then following. Uh, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and it comes down from the Father of life, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God is so good, he does not change one degree. There's not one degree of shadow in God. God's not going to tell you one thing and then show you something else. God's not going to promise you one thing and then come in the back door with something he didn't promise. God gives good things. Everybody say that. God gives good things. God gives good things. Say this. God gives only good things. God gives only good things. Let's say it again. God gives only good things. That's what that says. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. In other words, James says, I want to paint a picture for you so that you can kind of get it in your mind that when God is in heaven and God's pouring out on you, it's like beams of cosmo, cosmo light shining down on you that just like, an, like, a, like a laser beam shines good things and only good things. Every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights in which there's not even one shadow of turning in him. God's not two-faced. God's not fickled. God's not like your friend who says they love you and stabs you in the back. God is, God is you can count on God. And when God gives good things, all good things may not be pleasant things. Are we right about this? Yeah. Just, because it's, just because it's good doesn't mean you're going to like it, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, how many of you grew up in a generation of me with me? Uh, my, you're you're in your 60s now. Let me just say you are above. Okay, a few of you, quite yeah, <laughs> a few of you that claimed it. All right, <laughs> some of you borderline folks. I'm watching you. I know you. Are. You're one year away from it, but you won't claim it. I know. Okay, all right. I was just going to mention something we all have in common. That is not pleasant, but it was good for us, evidently, because here we are, uh, you know, castor oil. Oh, no. I mean, have you ever had any of that wonderful, marvelous, miraculous gift of God? <laughs> I don't know what castor oil is. I really don't. I don't know what castor oil is, but I know that my mom believed in it because every time I got sick, she said, here, take some of this castor oil. 
And, and all of a sudden, miraculously, I got well. It was, I mean, it was the most amazing thing. It was like, here, take this. I didn't even have to, I didn't even have to take it. She said, just here, take it. And just by her mere mentioning, take it, I got well. <laughs> I don't know what, what it was. I said, Mom, this is a miracle, you know? And, 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 but, but anyway, uh, if you did have to take it, it usually cured what ailed you. Well, it wasn't pleasant nastiest stuff you've ever had in your life. If you don't believe it, just go, hey, look, you, you young people, you, you millennials and you, you young people, you, you need to experience some life. What, let me tell you what you do. Do what you do. After church today, sometime this afternoon, go down to the drugstore and find some. They'll have some on the shelf. Yeah, just go down there and say, walk up. You might have to ask the clerk and say, do you have any castor oil? And what? Do you have any castor oil? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's back there. On the, and get you some of it and buy it and take it home. And you Get home before you take any of it, all right? Don't, don't just walk out in, in the parking lot and drink some of it. Wait till you get home, sit down in your recliner or on the couch, and then take some of it, all right? Get you a spoon and just fill it up and just, mm. Oh, take you a spoon of that casserole. But it's good for what ails you. It'll help you. It'll, it'll, it'll make you happy that you... Don't have to take it anymore, you know. <laughs> it'll, it'll bless your life. So God, I'm talking about God. I'm still on my text now. I'm talking about God. All right, I'm just telling you that God doesn't give you castor oil. I'm, you know, I'm going to just tell you that God gives good stuff. Now, it might not be pleasant stuff, but it is good because lots of things that are good for you are not pleasant, right? Lessons you have to learn that you must know they're not fun to go through, right? And you don't, you're not laughing all the way and ho, 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 and ha, ha, ha. It, it, it's tough, right? Well, God gives good stuff. That's what James says. He says, look, don't get confused about things. The devil brings bad stuff into your life, and God brings only good stuff into your life. Now, I know that we live in a world that tries to tell us that God is not good. But James is saying, look, I know God, and God is good, and everything God gives is good. God does not encourage you to sin and ruin your life. God does not give you things that entice you to be evil and to go down in life. God gives you only things that encourage you to be better that encourage you to be stronger, to be braver, to be more honest, to be cheerful, to be joyful, to be kind, to be gracious, to be full of love. God gives only good gifts. So don't let the enemy tell you when something bad comes along in life, God doesn't love you and he sent this. No, God did not. God gives every good and every perfect gift is from above. Yeah. And comes down from the Father of lights. That's what James testifies to us. So he's just trying to make sure that you understand that when you're going through rough times and it seems like, you know, you need some help, that God's right there to help, that God's got a purpose, that God's going to carry you through some stuff. And even though you think it might not be good, it's going to be good. And it's going to work in you. Let me, let me give you just one little tiny testimony, and this is where my time always gets out of whack. Do you know it takes a little time to tell a story, doesn't it? But let me just tell you one little story. And this, is, this comes from my sister, and we've just had some of some similar stories, not the same disease, but some similar stories in our prayer group on Wednesday night. We, we have several of these, actually. Just like this, just different, just different disease. My sister was around 35 years old, and she came down with a problem where they could not stop her bleeding. And they gave her all kinds of medicines and all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, treatments for it, and she could not stop bleeding. And so we prayed as a church. Listen, she was a member of the church I pastored in Meridian. And, we, and I mean, this is my sister that's just two years younger than me. And we prayed for her, and we prayed that God would heal her. We brought her down to the altar. We anointed her with oil. We laid hands on her. We, we danced the heavenly jig. We called on the promises of God. 
I mean, I mean, we believed, we believed the whole church, the whole church, she had to take some medicine that made her lose all her hair. And so she had to, she was bald headed and she had to take, wear a, a cap to church because, you know, she was kind of like, I don't, you know, embarrassed and head's really white. No son's been there in her lifetime and she's lost all of her hair. Like in one week, she lost every bit of her hair and she wore a cap. And, you know, when she got to church that morning, everybody in the church had a cap on. I'm serious, didn't it? Didn't it? Everybody in the church, even me, I preached with a cap on. The choir had caps on. Everybody in the church had a cap on. I mean, we loved her. We prayed for her. We were praying for God to heal her. We didn't want her to, to, to lose this battle. And because they couldn't get it to stop, in spite of our prayers, in spite of our pleadings with God, all of us, church full of Christians, not just one Christian, not somebody pretending to be a Christian, but a whole church full of Bible-thumping, Bible-believing Christians from the kingdom of God and couldn't convince God to stop that blood. And the doctor said, all right, because of that, we're going to have to go in and we're going to have to just start removing stuff. So the doctor went in and started taking away stuff that was bleeding and was involved in it. Sent it to the lab. Lab report came back. 35 years old. Lymphoma cancer. Lymphoma. That ought to strike fear in everybody's heart when you even hear that word. That means every lymph node system in your body, which lymph nodes are all over your body, had cancer or had the potential for cancer because once it gets in a lymph node, it just goes in all the lymph nodes. And before you know it, they look at you and say, I'm sorry, you got three months. We can't do anything about this. And they took it out and they found it and they said, this is the very, very, very beginnings of this. And so they checked the lymph nodes everywhere it was, so, it was caught so quickly, it hadn't even gone to any of the other lymph nodes. They gave her some heavy chemo after that to make sure, like six or eight weeks of some real heavy stuff that made her sick. But then she didn't have to take any more, and she goes and she gets checked every five years now, and that's been uh, 35 years ago, 30 years ago. Hadn't had any more since then. What I'm telling you is, if God had answered our prayer her body would have died from cancer in her lymph nodes. And we were convinced that we were praying right. We were convinced that it was God's will to stop this bleeding that was ruining her life. But God said, trust me. God said, I know something you don't know. And I know that you're feeling bad towards me now. I feel like you're accusing me of not loving you and not loving her and not being real. You're probably even questioning whether there is a God and whether God can do anything and whether he wants to do anything. You have all kinds of, of doubts and fears and theories now because your prayers aren't being answered like you're praying them. But had God answered them like we prayed them, she wouldn't be here anymore. Because they never would have found it mm -hmm. until it was way, way too late. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, even though that wasn't pleasant, that was good. Yeah, yeah. Even unpleasant things, God does good things. Yeah, yeah. That's what James says, every good gift and every perfect gift comes yeah. down from the Father of lights. And if you'll cooperate with him instead of cursing him, mm -hmm. if, you'll, if you'll understand him, see, James is saying, understand your father. And, 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 and don't let the enemy turn you against Papa yeah. as if somehow we can't trust Papa. <laughs> somehow Papa's always loved us, but now he doesn't anymore. What happened to Papa. The enemy, the enemy says he doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. He can't do anything. You misunderstand God. You don't know anything about God. There is no God. If it was a God, God would do something about me, me, me. That's the enemy. 
And James says, James says, get this straight. Make, do not be deceived. Put this on a roadside at the major intersection of life. God is good right there. So every time you drive by it, you see it and say, yep, God's good. And so James says, understand that. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. There's the word of God. Everybody say, the word of truth is the word of God. The word of truth is the word of God. It's the only truth we have, folks. You don't know truth. You only know what God says is truth. And you won't know truth until God tells you it's truth. You don't discover truth. God reveals truth to you. And the Bible is God's revelation of what is true. This is where you learn what to do, learn how to act, learn what you're supposed to do, learn where to go, where not to go, what to say, what not to say, where to be, how to receive, how to believe, how to act when you believe. That's the word of truth. And James says God birthed us by the word of truth out of his own will so that we could be a sort of first fruits. In other words, God needs an apple of his eye. God needs a, a captain of creation. God needs somebody to shine forth his light on this world. And he created us out of his own will by the word of truth that we might be that first fruits on this earth. We might be the first fruits of all of his creation. We might be the masters. We might be the tops. We might might be the one that reflects him more than anything. And then he goes on and he says, all right, so when you ask me, when you need wisdom and you ask me and you say, God, what, what am I going through? Why is this happening? What do I need to do? How can I help this? Is there something I can do? God, what, what, which way do I go? Do I go with the doctors? Do I hear them? Uh, by the way, they are gifts from God. I really believe this. I believe, I believe that part of the gift of healing is our physicians and, and medicine. I, you know, it's just beyond my belief what, what things have been discovered and what things are able to do. It's just beyond humanity. It is. It's just beyond humans' ability to be able to do any of this stuff. I mean, I, I could preach for an hour on that, but just I, I believe that. And, and, and so what do I need to do? So when you start asking, God starts telling you because he's going to tell you. And so how do you hear it? You hear it from the word of truth. And we've already been through three of them. How am I to receive the, from the word of truth? I'm to receive quickly. In other words, the verse is, uh, I, well, I've just got these in, all in a row because you already have them fill out. Quickly, quietly, and calmly. The verse says, be swift to listen, be slow to speak, and be slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the judgment of God. In other words, it doesn't. It, your anger keeps you from receiving some things. So it, get the message. Look, look at last week. It, it, it's all there. Let's give, it, give me the new ones here. All right. Verse 21. Therefore... Remember, we're talking about how to receive the Word of God. How do we receive the Word of God? I just use the adverbs, trying to be cute. You know, I mean, it's not in in the Word. It's not adverbs. I just made them up to try to help you remember what it is you need to do to hear the Word of God. So when you ask him and he starts speaking to you, how, how do you listen? You listen quickly. Don't listen to all that bunch of junk. Listen to his Word quickly. Get in his word quickly. Listen to what he says. Then quietly, don't, you know, let him speak to you about it. And then calmly, get that anger, get that frustration, get all of that out. And then the next little instruction, verse 21, therefore lay aside all filthiness. Now let me talk to you about this lay aside for just a second. I, I wrote it in your outline. Let me just, let me just read it because I'll probably be quicker. Lay aside gives a word picture of someone that, who is a fastidious dresser. Everybody say, Brother Charles. Brother Charles. All right. The, the word lay aside gives you a picture, a word picture of somebody like Brother Charles. 
Someone who is a fastidious dresser, always neat, uh, just so, looking as if they stepped off the pages of Cosmopolitan magazine. If their clothes get a little soiled, it means an instant change of clothing. To wear something with a spot, <laughs> that's out of the question. We are to take off and strip away all filthiness as a picky dresser would quickly pick off a piece of lint. I mean, Brother Charles, as dapper as he is, if there was a piece of lint, he would see it and boom, boy, it'd be gone. If he spilled something on one of those jackets, he wouldn't keep that thing on. No, my, no, 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 no. That thing, I got to change my whole wardrobe. That thing's nasty. James says, just like someone like that would do with their clothes, we are to do that with sin in our life. We're to, we're to pay attention and lay aside quickly, strip it off, get it out of our life. All filthiness. And here, here's, here's the next, an overflow of wickedness. Now, let me, those of you that are old school and, and read the old King James Version of the Bible, that you had another word there, and I'm going to mention it to you because it does have a meaning. The word, the old King James would say, lay aside all filthiness and the superfluity of naughtiness is the phrase it used, the old English phrase, and superfluity of naughtiness. Now, I say that because I want you to know that the word superfluity is an old English word, obviously, and it, and it, and it is connected generally with a medical expression. And the medical expression had something to do with removing excess earwax from your ears so that you could hear. Now, taking that thought in mind, what does that say to you? That says, I am to strip off anything that is sinful in my life like a picky dresser would strip off something that he just spilled a little coffee on and wouldn't wear it to work all day, but would change clothes before he left the house because that is an offense to him. And like somebody whose ears are full of earwax and can't hear would go to the doctor and get the earwax cleared out of their ear so that they could then hear what was being said. And James is saying, sin is like earwax. Sin will block you from hearing the word of God. So how am I to hear the word of God? I'm to hear it purely. Purely goes in that blank. Did I write that? No, there it is. Didn't tell you what it was first. Purely. I'm to listen quickly. I'm to listen quietly. I'm to listen uh, calmly. And I'm to listen purely. Get that stuff off of me. Get it out of my life. Get it away from me. Get my ears cleared out. You know, in the Bible, there's an expression, uh, uh, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Have you read this like in the book of Revelation and some of the prophetic books? It says, and let him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. Have you got your ears on? We, you know, the CB craze. Have you got your ears on, good buddy? I mean, you know, that's what God is saying. Uh, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I know, I know it's going in your ears and, your, and, and the stirrup and the, and the drum and everything's just vibrate. I, I know physically it's making the vibrations and all that kind of stuff, but are you hearing what I'm saying? So listen purely. And then he goes on in verse, he's not finished with verse 21, and receive, you see that, with meekness, the engrafted word which will save your soul. Meekness, meekness, meekness. Look in your outline. I wrote it to you. I, I like reading my own writing here. I like it. Fires me up. Meekness has to be one of the most misunderstood quali qualities in existence. When you say the word meekness, it almost immediately conjures up images of Popeye without spinach. The phrase meek as a mouse comes to mind. Some people say meek as a lamb. They use the word meek as if it means weak. Meekness is the exact opposite of those mental images. It means strength under control. There are only two men in the Bible as described as meek. One of them is Jesus and one of them is Moses. And I don't think either one of them were wimps, do you? It was meekness. Everybody say strength under control. It was meekness that allowed Jesus to stand there and have his beard plucked out of his face and not wipe out everybody that was there. That was meekness. 
It was meekness that allowed somebody to walk up and spit in his face. And him turn the other cheek for him to spit on that side. It was meekness that allowed him to bend over a boulder and have somebody with a cat of nine tails beat his body until you couldn't even recognize it as a human being anymore. When he could have batted one eyelash and 10,000 angels. No, it didn't need 10,000 angels. One angel would have come from heaven and destroyed this world. Michael was probably sitting up there in heaven looking at it going... Come on, Jesus, just one flicker, man. Come on. I, get, I mean, just even make, just flinch that eyelid. I mean, just flinch that eyebrow. I mean, just, just give me a little crease in that eyebrow. Buddy, I'm coming down there. We're getting rid of these. Come on, man. I can't wait. I'm, ooh, I want me some of that. But Jesus didn't even crimp one eyebrow. Why? Meekness. Strength under control. When I receive the word of God, I am to receive the word of God under control, yeah, yeah. my strength under control, it, pro it, it, it produces humility. This is what he's really, I mean, the, the whole concept of that receive with meekness the engrafted word is promoting the concept of being humble, of having humility in your life. You're not the center of the in universe. You're not the king of the world. The world doesn't owe you everything. God is not at your beck and call. You serve God. He doesn't serve you. Yeah, yeah. Humility. It's like, like I heard a Bible student. Wes, you'd appreciate this because you've, you've just gone to school and campus. A Bible student went up to a college in Tennessee, and he shared a little story. He said when he went up there, uh, he had to be there before Monday. They had the opening convocation and the big frou-frou, what poopy to do. And so he had to get there uh, on Saturday to get all his stuff in the dorm and so forth. And, so he, he had all his stuff pat, just packed into his car, few, few pieces of furniture that he could get in there and all kinds of boxes and all kinds of stuff like that. He was going to need some help getting all this stuff out and especially getting them up to the third floor, which is where the freshmen were, which if you've ever been to school, you know, that's where they usually put them. And, uh, and, 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 and so... He, he drove onto campus, and it was a Saturday, and, it didn't, and no one was there. And he looked around. He went to building, 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 couldn't find anybody. Finally went over there to the dorm where he was supposed to be, went out on the first floor, knocked on every door in the dorm on the first floor. Nobody answered the door. It was nobody. Went up to the second floor. Nobody answered the door. Anyway, went up to the third floor, and the door on the very end of the hall, somebody answered it. It was a, it was a gentleman, uh, about middle middle-aged looking guy, uh, had on a you know, you know a shirt, didn't have a tie. You know he's dressed kind of casually, and, um, and 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 he said uh, he said, "Son, can I help you?" And he said, "Well, sir, I, I've been knocking on all these doors, and I, I've got a car load of stuff, and I got some some of that stuff so heavy I can't get it by myself. And I I was really trying to find see if somebody could help me get my stuff out of my car up in, up in my room." And he said, "Well, I, I can help you." And uh, and the young man said, "Are you the janitor?" And he said, no, but I, I, I like to try to help the janitor at times. And he helped him get all his stuff out. And all. Monday morning at the convocation, they're all sitting there. You know, the whole campus is sitting there, and the stage is up there with all the dignitaries up there. And, they, and, 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 and somebody comes up and introduces the president of the college and with all this pomp and circumstance of all who he is and everything he's done and what a wonderful man and how great the college is because of him. And, and, and he said, when he walked up to the stand, it was that man that help him unload his car. That's what James says. James says, meekness. Meekness. When God speaks to us that, that God will do something on the inside of us, that God will, God, will, God will place inside of us, into our heart, into our soul, into our mind, a, a, a stability. Think of it this way. God is going to place into you a stability that will make you able to bear up in the, in the pressures of life so that others can see Jesus in you. And he goes on to say, you know, when he, when he plants himself inside of you and he plants this strength inside of you and he grafts it in. Any of you know what a graft is? You know, when they graft something... 
when they graft it, in other words, they introduce something and then and they put it and it and it ends up growing into it. It grows to be a part and it strengthens it and makes it strong and and or gives it a new life, you know. And, and anyway, James is saying the word of God will graft itself inside of you and will give you strength to bear up under the pressures of life, and ultimately it will save your soul. That's what God does. So when you receive the word of God, you are receiving a strength and a power that is, that is going to rescue your life. And I submit to you that there's not a single life in this building that doesn't need rescuing. That's why we need a savior. Unless Jesus Christ has has come into your heart and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and has sealed you and <clears throat> matured you by the word of God and engrafted that word of God in you, <clears throat> inevitably you are going to shipwreck your life on those rocks that lie right under the surface of that, uh, of that ocean that you're spending your life on. And James says you don't, it doesn't have to happen to you. Jesus will rescue your soul. The word of God will strengthen you and give you a strength. And that strength is his word. So do you catch what James... Thank you, Isaac. Such a meek man. I'm serious. That's one of the most brilliant people in this world. What does he do? Go get his pastor a bottle of water. Like, like some servant of something. That's meekness. That's what that is. James says, are you getting this? Mm -hmm. you see, do, you, do you guys feel James' heart? Do you, do you feel this? What he's saying to us about God and about what God wants for us and how God provides for us and, and the fact that, that he does all of this so that we can be mature lacking nothing, we can be strong, we can be capable, we can be able, we can be powerful, we can be true, we can be loyal, we can, be, we can stand up under the load, we can, we, we can be men and women of God that look like Jesus in this old crazy dark world we're living in, which is the purpose of God for our lives, for every one of our lives. You say, am I doing what God wants me to? Well, are you looking like Jesus? If you're not looking like Jesus, then no, you're not doing what God wants you to. Because that's why he created you. So that when people look at you, they see Jesus. They may not know who Jesus is, but they see somebody there that is so different from them. What in the world do they have that I don't have? I mean, I've seen people go home and they come to the Lord and they go home and they badger their family and they harass their family and beat on their family and everything else of their family trying to convince them, you need Jesus, you need the Lord. Remember? I mean, just jabbering out one end and upside down and one end or the other. And God says, just be quiet. Mm -hmm. Just live a life that says to your family, something has happened to me that is so deep within me that if you don't get this, you're missing out on something. And then they will say to you, what do you have that I don't have? And you can say, it's Jesus Christ living on the inside of me. Don't just let them think I'm a nice person. You know, I mean, don't let them think that the reason you live the way you live is because you're nice and they're not. It's not, you're not nice. Christ lives in you. You're not smart. Christ lives in you. And he wants to live in them. And James says that's why he does all this stuff. So that the purpose of God, that the purpose that Jesus would be reflected to this world might shine through our lights. And so he says receive the word with meekness and it'll, it'll attach itself, it'll graft itself inside of you. And when all the rest of the world's falling apart, you won't be falling apart. If you've ever met anybody like this, they probably worried you, didn't they? Probably, what's wrong with them? You, you hear what you think? You think they don't really get it, do they? They don't, they don't know how bad this really is, do they? Yes, they know how bad it is, but they know how good God is. 
And they don't fall apart because something has grafted itself inside them that is solid and stable so that when they hit the rocks that are just under the surface of life, their boat doesn't go down. You sitting here bailing water, bailing water, bailing water, trying to save your boat. And, Jesus, and James is saying God's got a patch for that if you'll receive this from the Word of God. Every opportunity you have to hear the Word of God, you need to take advantage of it. I don't care if it's, if it's coming from a first grade Sunday school teacher. The Word of God is powerful. It's, it's there to give you life. It's there to change things in life, to strengthen you, to make life better for you. You know, you talk about, I want peace, I want peace. Peace comes from the Word. How do you have peace when everything's falling apart? you got to have something bigger than you are in control that you're confident in. That's the only way. Good night. You say, boy, Pastor, you are... No, I'm not something special. Christ lives on the inside of me. I've been with Jesus for 45 years. When you look at me, you ought to see what Christ is like and what... And, and what he wants. And I, I mean, if not, I'm not shining right. You know, I need to get in there and get the word more in me. I'm not saying I'm Jesus, and don't get me wrong, because they probably already think we have a cult going up here anyway. But, but you people on the internet, this is not a cult. All these people live in different places. I want you to know that. And I'm not saying I'm Jesus. I'm just saying that I reflect Jesus, because that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> If I didn't, something would be wrong. I can't say that to you. All right, where am I? Um, let me give you the, let me give you, can't even do it. Let me just say amen. All right? <laughs> let me just say amen. Let me, let me give you one little thing, and we'll chew on this next week. I know it's Christmas, but and, and I'm not going to preach James all the way through Christmas. I'm going to give you some Christmas stuff, all right? Uh, some some good stuff, by the way. Some stuff I had last year. So, <laughs> some stuff I had. Some stuff I had last year about Christmas, and I didn't get to preach it. So it's been saved. It's been saving. I'm using my time. I'm using my time. All right. Let me give you this. All right. All right. Here. We, thank you, B. I appreciate you. Brian ought to be back next week. He'll help you. You and Bell. You and Bell are getting worn out. I'm done. Um. All right. James is given us a picture of the Word of God as being, he's given us three views. I would say similes, but you would probably say, oh, who does he think he is? Um, he uses three similes here. And, and, and one of them you've all, I've already been talking to you about. James says the, the Word of God is, that's meekly, let me go on is a strong root that has been engrafted in you. So see, he, 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 on top of all that other stuff that I've just said to you, he's, he's, he's writing on top of that. He's not just saying that. He's saying some more on top of it. He's saying the Word of God, if you want to know what the Word of God is like, it's like a strong root that is engrafting inside of you. Second thing is I don't have time. Ah, let me get it. Let me get it. Let me get it. Let me stop right there. This is good. This is too good to just zoom through, guys. And this past time. All right, stand your feet.